a weekly program produced by gay men and women for and about the homosexual community in Winnipeg. We offer news, information, and entertainment from gay people here and around the world. We've planned this program to interest our family and friends as well. So even if you're not gay, why not join us for the next half hour? We'd like you to find out more about what we're really like. Hi, welcome to Coming Out. It's been a subject of some discussion, both in the gay media and also the straight press, as to whether there is something that may be fairly called gay culture, gay art, a gay sensibility. It's a funny question to ask because the last 20 years have seen a tremendous outpouring of gay poetry and fiction and all kinds of writing, uh, theater of all kinds, film, guerrilla theater and performance art, dance and music, photography and painting, just every form of graphic art that is explicitly, unavoidably, sometimes outrageously gay and lesbian. Our guest tonight is one of the producers of that sensibility. He is Noel Gregg, a founder of the Gay Sweatshop Theatre in Britain, who visited Winnipeg in September and October because one of his plays was being produced by the Manitoba Theatre for Young People. Noel, let's begin by your telling us about the Gay Sweatshop. Gay Sweatshop uh, began in 1975 in London in a small basement theatre and it was the first attempt by professional actors, writers, directors who were lesbian and gay to take control of that medium. Um, it was a political statement that came out of the gay movement, if you like, um, and it was saying if we are going to be represented in this media, we want to do it ourselves, for ourselves. We want to find our own voices in this medium. So that was the, that was the philosophy behind Gay Sweatshop. It was the first professional theatre company with trained workers who were saying, we are doing work that gives voice to lesbian and gay experience, and we're also lesbian and gay. Well, 1975 was pretty early in the, in the game. Or did it work? Yes, it was hugely successful. Um, there were, the first season was called Homosexual Acts. And um, I actually wasn't involved in that season. Um, I came on board just a little after that. And uh, there were queues around the block. It was lunchtime theatre. And there were queues around the block. The season extended for, I think, for about, it was going to be on for three weeks and it went on for four months and then it transferred to the uh, to the ICA which is a larger theatre and then uh, a group of people from that season got together and decided they were going to constitute themselves as a full-time company and tour the work around around the country um, the Arts Council of Great Britain which um, funds funded still does just Fund's new work, um, and at that time was very, very keen on watering the, the fringe, which was burgeoning at the time, said, um, uh, well, no, we won't give you any money, um, because um, uh, we give work to theatre companies that perform for all people, for everybody out there. Um, now, that wasn't entirely true, because they were beginning to fund black work, and there was a company called the Women's Theatre Group that they were funding, and... Um, uh, but uh, they, they, they weren't going to fund gay, gay Sweatshop to begin with. They did in the end. They had to because the quality of the work and the, um, the, the, the manner in which the work was accepted by, by audiences, and on, um, across the board audiences actually, um, um, uh, um, gave the company the credit. So that, uh, it's still going. It's uh, still continuing. Um, I don't know how long. Is that nearly 18 years, I suppose? Yes. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, I, I can imagine that the English language had a, a theater repertoire that contained, depending on how closely one looked, scores of pieces which were covertly gay or had gay mm -hmm. characters, sort of. But that doesn't sound to me like the sort of thing that would have satisfied this group. You must have had to start by writing what you performed. That's right. Uh, of course, there were, you know, we'd had, um, we'd had Orton, Joe Orton. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd had plays such as the Green Bay Tree. We'd had, we'd had plays that um, had gay 
lesbian or gay representation on one level or the other. And of course, we'd had work coming over from this continent. We'd had boys in the band and so on and so forth. But um, the whole area of, all right, what's, what's a gay play? And what's the gay sensibility? Um, I don't really care for the word sensibility. It's sort of, um, it feels a little sort of precious, a bit refined, a bit cut off, a bit Grates, not, does it? It's, it grates slightly, a bit not accessible to, to anybody. It's a bit precious, a bit sort of this is ours and not yours. Um, I'm much more interested in talking about how we rediscover our voices, how we make our voices known, how we rediscover our past. I've forgotten the question you asked me. Did you write your own stuff? Right. And how right. else did you, could you operate? That's right. <laughs> that's right. Creating our own material. Uh, and so that, it didn't mean throwing, throwing overboard um, everything that one can learn from um, you know, the plays that have existed in the past. Uh, but what it meant was somehow, if there is such a thing as gay theatre, I would not include um, I wouldn't include Joe Orton, I wouldn't include Tennessee Williams, uh, much as, well, I, I love Tennessee Williams, I'm not so sure about Orton, but um, if we're going to use that term, I would say that it's theatre that is creating itself in the conscious knowledge of 1969, of Stonewall, uh, in conscious no knowledge that uh, there is a thing called the radical gay movement. Um, so that is very different, you know, there are there are plays that are written now that um, I think all plays now, all gay playwrights who are lesbian or gay, actors who are lesbian or gay, are operating in the knowledge that there was a shift in history. Suddenly, um, we came out of uh, closets and onto the streets. So this was marched. political theatre? Well, in its broadest and best sense, um, uh, theatre that was acknowledging um, uh, a mass oppression, if you like, and that there are individual lives within it, um, hopefully at its best, not nourishing three-dimensional reson resonating theatre that is conscious of where it, its political roots can lay. Mm -hmm. Well, mm. positive theatre, I mean, I mean, in the decade before that, mm. there had been at least a small amount of really ugly gay themes, mm. the conduct unbecoming, the mm. killing of Sister George. Sure. Uh, do you suppose there, there was a kind of reaction to that? It's very difficult, that, isn't it? That, so if we're going right, we want to make it very clear that we are everywhere and we're everybody and we're judges and we're doctors and we're minors and we're housewives and we're nurses and dentists and da 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 um, And we're three-dimensional and we live full human lives. Then we're, we want to show ourselves what and all. I believe that's what we have to do. I think at the beginning we tended to shy away from that and tended to sort of want to show the good gay heroes, aren't we nice? And so we all became a bit squeaky clean and sort of, you know, and it's sort of at the end it's all sort of, we're nicer than nice. Well, we know that's not true. And uh, the problem with the warts and all aspect of it is, is that those you know, those people out there, a lot of them that you're wanting to talk to, if you show them the wart, that's all they'll see. Well, they uh, had also seen things that, mm. like Boys in the Band that were only warts. Uh, that's right. A collection of warts. That's right. That's right. Very good, a collection of warts. Yes, yeah, so that's... I think that there's been a shift, definitely, from um, sort of not wanting... slightly backing off from uh, showing us in, in, in all our dimensions. But, I mean, in the end, that we have to. We have to. Yes. Can you tell us some of the names of the plays that originated with a sweatshop, in mm. case we should have a chance to see it? Absolutely. Well, the first one that I wrote was a play called As Time Goes By. Uh, it has been done in North America by companies, but not in Canada. It's published. And that was um, probably the most significant in many ways, because it was the first, it, it was the first gay history play. It was in three sections. The first was set in Victorian England, the second was set in Weimar, Germany, and the third was set in the Stonewall Bar on the, on the night. The, on the night. Mm -hmm. And it was about groups of ordinary gay men in those times and situations. It was about placing gay men in history 
at sort of very crucial moments in history. And I suppose attempting to say, even though we've been marginalized, we were not necessarily passive. Um, and of course, the, the play ends with the drag queen saying no to the policeman, which um, is sort of takes that aspect of our history to a, a particular uh, conclusion. Um, it was a sort of quite a seminal play because uh, the writer of Bent, the play Bent, Martin Sherman, uh, had his first play put on by Gay Sweatshop in that season I was talking about, a play called Passing By. And Martin, uh, we hired Martin as the, uh, the voice coach for the American section of As Time Goes By. He was very interested in the German section which ended at a certain point. And he said, oh, I want, to, I want to write a play that is the sequel to that. And he went away and he wrote Bent. So um, but the, as time goes by, gave rise to that play. Mm -hmm. so, um, and I think a, a lot of the work that I've done for the company have tended to be historically rooted plays, partly because by training I'm a historian. I studied history at university. And I suppose I, I've seen possibly one of my contributions to the gay movement and the culture that's come out of it has been looking at our histories and the lives of ordinary or sometimes um, sometimes famous gay people but mainly sort of ordinary gay people at moments in history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there consistent strains of reaction or response to the situation that you find through that whole history? Re, re, reappear, perhaps? For, from audiences? No, from in, in the characters, oh. in the actions of the characters. I mean, were, were there consistencies that you found between Victorian Britain and Weimar Germany and mm. Stonewall? Well, what I've... Yes. Um, th well, there are the same set of contradictions. Yeah. You know, the, the businessman in the Stonewall bar who actually sort of wants to sort of not join in mm. is the same as, you know, the... Uh, the, the gay nightclub owner in Weimar, Germany, who backs away and sort of finds his corner that he hopes he can hide in. So I think that, that if you look at or, or imagine, because the documentation is of our histories is, is uh, something that we're still finding, that um, the sort of uh, choices that history imposes on us, that we, we will take the, the spectrum of, um, of uh, we will take the spectrum of choices. We would be bra brave and we'll be cowardly and you know we will uh, do things that we never expected we'd do. Um, we're cunning, we're sly, we're challenging, we're defiant and that's what I'm interested in sort of like how how we've taken on board the moment that we live in. Mm -hmm. Well if London has anything enough that one would never exhaust its supply I would say it was live theatre and yet you were saying that the sweatshop drew significant audiences from the beginning. Mm. Who were in those audiences? Were those gay people, lesbians, finally seeing themselves on stage that came, or just anyone? Because it was a lunchtime theatre, um, that was very popular at the time. Um, peop pe people in business used to go and see a play. Yeah. Uh, and, and it must have been short. For yes, you'd, a 40-minute play, and you know, they'd buy a cup of coffee in the foyer and their sandwich. And that was, a, that was a very interesting phenomenon at the time. It sort of died out. Um, so, who knows who, I mean, I imagine that amongst those there would have been a great many um, people who were lesbian and gay. Um, one in the archives of Sweatshop are the letters that we, s we still get, the company still gets from, I came and saw your play last night, I nearly didn't go because I didn't dare go in. I came and saw your play and the next day I went to work and told my best friend that I was gay. Though, though we st those letters that the company used to have in floods, mm -hmm. they still happen very often. Um, because it's called Gay Sweatshop, I think that's quite a challenge, particularly once you're out of sophisticated London and you're in the sticks, you're in the provinces, uh, where it's sometimes more threatening um, to go and see a Gay Sweatshop play has often been the first step that people have made to coming out. Mm -hmm. the, the use of the term sweatshot, incidentally, does suggest a kind of blue-collar sense. The, the word sweatshop came out of, um, 
Yes, it's not, it's horrible. It's it's horrible, horrible processing these plays. It's, it's you were like, bolting them together. It's because um, when the company started, there was no money. Everybody was doing it on the dole, and it was like working in a sweatshop. Um, and also, it was a bit like sort of there was a bit of a genre of theatre. Uh, theatre companies had rather sort of um, bit workerist titles, belt and braces, 784 Scottish People's Theatre, sort of a bit sort of gay sweatshop, it's sort of quite 70s militant sort of in there with the workers type of titles, yeah. Well, under the fingernails. And that's right, that's right, yes. Yeah. Well, you're not with the sweatshop anymore. Does it continue to exist? Yes, it, it exists. Um, uh, I, I'm not attached to it. I wrote, a, I wrote a sequel for As Time Goes By for it three years ago to mark, I think it was the 21st anniversary of Stonewall, called Paradise Now and Then, which was my last play for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd, I'd worked for it, with it, and other companies, but sweatshop centrally for ten, about 10 years. And, um, uh, a lot of the time, well, at one point where we lost our funding for a couple of years, so the office became my bedroom, and so it all got a bit tiring <laughs> in the end. And yeah. uh, and then I, when it became appropriate for me to be leaving the company, I'd become involved in working for companies that produce work for young people, and so it seemed natural that I that I sort of go into that area more. Mm -hmm. In fact. Um, it's one of the reasons that I'm here in Winnipeg, because uh, two theatre companies in England toured uh, plays of mine for young people around mm -hmm. um, the Young People's Festivals in, in Canada. I think they both came to Winnipeg and were, were very successful. And after that, um, some more of my plays were done up at the university, yeah. um, uh, plays for young people, one about Christopher Marlowe. And one of, of all people. Mm -hmm. Of all people. Um, so yes, uh, exploring. Well, of course, sexuality came into that too. Um, Marlowe's sexuality, and uh, and another one called Plague of Innocence, which um, a group of students from the university took to the Edmonton Fringe Festival. Is that right? Is there a Fringe Festival yes. at Edmonton this year? They just finished doing it, mm. uh, and that's about AIDS. Mm. We'll come back to your production mm. here in a mm. moment, but I was just wanted to, to go back a bit to the sweatshop. It's, mm. it's said already that there has been an evident succession of generations among gay activists. That there was the first wave, as it were, of people who were older, mm. uh, who had grown up in the most homophobic atmosphere, whose actions and reactions were conditioned by that, who had a kind of edge, an ardency, a bitterness, uh, mm. uh, that, that was born of that experience. And they have mm. been succeeded by young people who have not been brought up in that, but in a more liberal mm. atmosphere, and whose outlook and whose issues are therefore mm. somewhat different. Mm. Did, 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 is that observable, for example, in the sweatshop? Did, was there one group who followed another in any way there? I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think there was... I think there was a philosophy behind it of not wanting to create work which was about playing victim. I think wanting to talk about how we can be victimized, but the experience of being victimized does not necessarily mean that we have to play victim. And I think that, if anything, that, that, that has been one sort of consistent um, element in the work. Now, I can't speak for Sweatshop at the moment because I haven't really been involved with it for the last three years. And so, therefore, it might, it might begin to reflect the sort of the new radicalism that is around, that I am not so, the politics of queer, um, which has sort of transposed itself from North America to England. And um, I am not so involved in that myself, so, which feels strange. I mean, it's a... I, I don't feel centrally involved in that debate, so um, it might well be that the company begins to reflect certain th aspects of things that are going on that I, I'm, yes, I'm not so centrally concerned with mm -hmm. or in. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, the process of, of British political life insofar as it concerned homosexuals, it seemed to me, was, was typical of that uh, in the way it was dealt with all minorities. That is, there was an initial period of liberalism, and then 
the iron hand, perhaps, of, of reaction, of, of, of sort of judgmentalism, of the sort of the fundamental bedrock of conservatism that seems never to have left, especially the, mm. the British upper class, mm. reasserted itself, but as it turns out, only temporarily in Clause 28, and yes. these sorts of things. But now it seems to have been gone, and I think it's gone for good. Is that your impression in Britain, that, that now there will be an unhindered growth of acceptance of gays and lesbians in British life? No, I'm not that optimistic. Um, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I think that it's a deeply, deeply um, prejudiced society, and that the, the the people that, that without power have been so conditioned, so conditioned over the, particularly the last two centuries, that um, I think that there are deep funds of racism and homophobia in, in our country that, bec that are expressed in, in, the, in sort of liberal ways that only, that, sort of can, that only England can come up with. So no, I don't feel that optimistic. And the other thing to remember about our country, that country, um, our country, I don't regard it as my country, the world's my country. Um, we must remember that Oxbridge still rules um, that it's those white, middle-class, heterosexual boys from Oxbridge, they run the work still. Um, they, you know, there are enough sort of black people or women or gays and lesbians sort of who've been absorbed, allowed to have been absorbed into all the different institutions for it to look sort of all right. But in the end, it's that class and, and, and that territory of person that still runs that country. Mm. Well, now, in, in North America, the, for the, the progress of the gradual reduction practically speaking, and I think even in, in people's minds of homophobia, has mm -hmm. been more or less continuous, uninterrupted, even though we had mm -hmm. Anita Bryant and AIDS, yes. which might have been seen to be mm -hmm. the, the, the constitution, the source of a backlash. In fact, they have turned out to be great advantages. Mm -hmm. they, was that true of, of this period of reaction in Britain, this Clause 28, whereby the, the national government forbade the spending of money to, mm -hmm. in any way that might be seen to encourage homosexuality? Was there, does it, was that in the end, a, a, a spur to organizing, a, a, a yes. making people feel obliged to take their, their situation seriously. Yes, Clause 28 was a great galvanizer for the movement again, and it brought the lesbians and the gay men together. Obviously, that was happening through AIDS as well. Um, Clause 28, to a certain extent, backfired on the government, but although it's still there, the Labour Party made no attempt to oppose it. Um, the Labour Party did not mention it in its manifesto in the recent election that it lost. Um, it's still on the statute book and uh, it has created, it's inoperative, you know, the, 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 to the uh, illegalizing the promotion of homosexuality in schools. I mean, I was saying to somebody, a group of uh, young people I was working with the other week, we were talking about it, and I said, you know, I grew up in a, a little town in the East Midlands in, in, in England, a long way away from any city, surrounded by a, a, a sea of heterosexuality. It was all there. It was being promoted at me. It didn't work. <laughs> didn't um, stick. It didn't stick, and of course it doesn't. Um, so it's sort of it, an inoperable clause, but on the other hand, a lot of a lot of people who are homophobic have been able to use that as a sort of um, a get-out clause. Oh, no, well, we can't book your play. Uh, well, you know, there's the clause, and it could endanger our other funding. There's been a lot of that, so it's sort of worked by stealth. But certainly the clause was, was uh, very valuable for us at a time when we were feeling very demoralized by the middle of that terrible 11 years of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the, just in the middle of that, all that awfulness of being, you know, plague carriers all over the front pages of the papers, it, it brought us together publicly, so it was useful on that level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now you are doing theatre for young people. Now, I would have thought that that would have been even more difficult to achieve, given your notoriety. Yeah. Well, of course, it's hedged around by, uh, even without the clause, all sorts of difficulties, um, but 
there are companies of theatre workers and there are teachers and youth workers that know that, that the sort of work that takes on sexuality that addresses young people is the most valuable and nourishing way to engage with them around all of this. Um, so, it, yes, it's not there on a plate, but um, it's, and not a lot of, not all of my plays for young people are specifically or explicitly around sexuality. They're informed by it, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, for me, at the moment, in, in our country, given that we're going through, we're still going through a period of terrible reaction, is that the most important constituency for me is young people mm -hmm. all, of all different ages. Mm -hmm. Well, the one that's being produced here mm -hmm. is, in the literal sense, a fabulous discussion mm -hmm. of censorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's called... What? It's called Whispers in the Dark. I wrote it for a, a British theatre company um, a few years ago. They toured it here and various the theatre companies in, there's a company in Ontario that's doing it, that has been doing it for a couple of years and, and now the Manitoba Theatre for Young People is doing it, yes. And it is, it's a fabled story about a land where the people are oppressed by the giants who came and colonised the land. And the giants outlawed books and reading and the telling of stories and the singing of songs and it's about a group of song singers and storytellers who carry on the oral tradition. now. I go, I'm gay, I know what I was writing about there. This is a load of people who weren't able to, their voices were stifled, and it's their struggle against the giants, uh, but, fra this, but framed within a, a fable story for five to seven-year-olds, yeah. But it would, as you say, resonate with other minority groups mm. who've had the Mm. Been had forced upon them the mm. same experience. That's right, yes. Which mm. must be true of all minorities. That's right, that's right. It's, a, it's one of those plays that because it is in sort of Never Never Land that can transpose. And it's sort of, I was watching a bit of the rehearsals the, uh, this afternoon and uh, it's got a bit of sort of the quality of the Wizard of Oz about it, if you like, where, you know, you can look at that, that's a journey you can look at and you can, you can beam your own experiences into it through those characters, mm -hmm. yes. We're just at our closing mm -hmm. moments. Would you like to tell our audience uh, the particulars of your play? It opens on the 15th of October at the Gas Station Theatre, and it's being produced by the Manitoba Young People's Theatre. Theatre for, for young, young people. people, yes. And it's called Whispers in the Dark. And it performs for two weeks, and then it tours all over the region. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. You will find a selection of plays and books about playwrights, gay and lesbian, in the library of the Winnipeg Gay and Lesbian Resource Center. The Resource Center is located at Suite 1, 222 Osborne Street South at the corner of Macmillan. It's open from 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. weeknights. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Good night.